What a privilege for you, for you, for us to have you with us. God is so good. You know, for some that may wonder before we present the guest speaker, may wonder why we worship kind of so radically. You know, I was reading this, and in 1 Kings 8.51, Solomon was the king, and he offered a brand new spanking temple to the Lord. And during the dedication of that temple, the Bible says, when the king and all of Israel, when the king and all of Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. Verse 63 says of 1 Kings 8, Solomon offered sacrifices of fellowship offering to the Lord. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. <laughs> I don't think there was just one altar, but I don't think there were 10,000 altars either. This worship of sacrifice took time. That's why it's called sacrifice. Because sometimes it is not easy to present ourselves before the Lord. You know why Israel came, went from a starter country, a novice country, an entry-level country in the reign of David and Solomon to the number one world power in the known world? Because they worshiped God and gave God time in worship and praise and sacrificial worship. That's why we take a little time to worship the Lord. We are not together that often, once or twice a week. So we make sure we give the Lord of Lords enough time where he could receive our worship with spirit and in truth. And as we speak to him and lift our hands and say how much he means to us, he opens the floodgates of mercy and grace to speak back to us. And the surest way to speak is through the authentic, infallible word of God. And we are so honored because within our midst there's a young woman of God. A young woman who is hungry to learn if submiss is submissive. She is faithful to her church and willing to learn first and foremost in the house that God has called her to be in. In January, we always make a list, usually just in a loose piece of paper and fold it up and put it in a drawer, of people that we would like to preach in this house, both guest speakers and people of the house. And we pray, and we pray to God, Lord, who is it? Who should we invite? Who should we speak to? And God confirmed this day six months ago. Because the day I made the list, my wife in the bedroom tells me only how she can. I think we should put Pamela to preach. And she was on my list. If you wonder how we go about picking these people, I just described how we go about picking these people. And God is so good. I could tell you that when we do this, we take it to prayer. And we are confident that it is the Lord. So without further ado, this young lady is a powerhouse in God and the best is yet to come. But today is a special day for everyone in this house. She's going to present the VIP that's with us today. So I'm going to have Pamela Taylor with us. Hallelujah. With the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so happy to be here in front of you all. And um, the VIP person that the pastor said I should uh, present is my mother. She came all the way from 
Georgia to hear me speak. So, Mommy, I'm so happy to have you here, and I love you. Amen. And Pastor and Pastor, thank you. Um, I, too, in worship was just feeling just the atmosphere of surrender. And I heard the Lord say, you know, sometimes you want to be delivered for something. But if you hold on to, to it, how can he surrender us from that thing? The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. It also says that his burden is easy and his yoke is life. If I never cast, if I never give, how can he deliver me from that thing, right? Amen. So we're going to continue on to that vein. I'm going to um, read the verse uh, of today, the title, and then we're going to go into prayer. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, we're going to just jump right in, and I'm going to start with Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27. Yes, amen. Luke chapter 14, 25 through 27. Thank you, Jose. Hallelujah. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So I want to present to you today uh, the title, which is The Traditional Christian is Dead, Ramping Up for Revival. Amen. Amen. So let me just give a backdrop to this. So when Pastor asked me months ago and said, you know, Pamela, would you preach? I was like, oh, yeah. Okay, okay yeah, I'll, I'll preach. You know, I was excited and nervous at the same time. And immediately, even before, it was a Thursday night, even before I left the church, I started asking God, Lord, what do you want to say? Lord, what should I talk about? I have no idea. And immediately the title, The Traditional Christian is Dead, popped up in my mind. I'm like, Lord, this is my first time like presenting in front of people. You're coming in hot. Like, ouch, that hurt my feelings. And, and I sat with it for weeks and, and for months, but the, it just stayed with me. So then I started asking more questions because, you know, when God gives you something, you can inquire. So I said, okay, Lord, what is it that you, you want to say? What, what word do you have for life missions? You know, because I want to speak exactly what is on his heart, right? And he led me to Luke chapter um, uh, 14, verse 25, right? And when I read this, you know, I had a lot of questions. I'm like, what is this chapter trying to tell us? Why is God using such harsh language and telling us to go against our natural desire, which is to love our family and friends? Are they inherently bad? And I just started reading over this story, and, I'm, and I had to admit, like, this is a strange story. Here we see Jesus address the crowd with less favorable truths. Jesus' fame had been growing through the land, and he gained a following, but not all were his disciples. Listen to this. He gained a following, but not all were his disciple. Knowing things about God doesn't make you a disciple. We see him address the crowd to weed out those uh, who, who, who weave out the heart of who's who to test the hearts of the crowd. His desire is to have true followers of his teaching and his word. Christ was never after an audience. He is after disciples. And I love this one. I was like, okay, Lord, you know. Uh, disciples usher in revival. Crowds do not. <laughs> Hallelujah. I told y'all coming in hot, you know? So, I, I, you know, studying and reading this, I really feel like the Lord's heart was just, you know, he's a good, good father. And the Bible says that he chastises who he loves. Like, he's not trying to embarrass us or say that we, we're, we're missing the mark. He's just calling us higher because he knows who we are. The Bible says that when we were in our mother's womb, he knew us, right? So he knows that you can go higher, that we can go higher, right? Amen. Hallelujah. So this story, I like to picture like, you know, Jesus just walking and the people, the crowd falling behind him and him just turning around and say, hey, if you love anything more than me, you are not my disciple. Jesus isn't instructing us to hate the people closest to us 
and we know this because we're an intelligent church. He is teaching us a valuable lesson. He's a great teacher, right? Amen. And what is that lesson? I'm glad you asked. He is addressing, and I'd like to submit to you, idolatry. Thou shall not have any other gods before me. He put what people love the most on the altar, right? Now, why would I say he's addressing idolatry? I'm going to get more into this. Christ is not saying that it's bad to love these things like your family and your friends, your hobbies. He's emphasizing and he's driving a point home, using what we love to most to teach us lessons. There should be no other gods before him, not even the good things, and we're going to get more into this, that we love. In, in our case, there should be nothing standing before heaven's desires, which is revival, and winning souls to the kingdom. All right, so I like to go with words. Let's, let's go to the word again. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And um, this, I'm going to just present to you like what, he, what he's attacking, like he's attacking idolatry or anything that we would want to put in his place, right? So Genesis 3, chap, no, chapter 3, verse 6, amen. So it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it, right? So this message right here, when God was downloading to me, is to make us vigilant, is to make us awake and aware. Like, he wants us to not be pawns in the enemy's schemes and plans. And, and I'm, I'm coming and I'm using Genesis because this is the beginning of our time. You know, we can learn a lot from, from Eve and Adam, and we can learn a lot about the enemy's tactic, tactics because they haven't changed. What was the lie that he told to Eve? God is withholding something from you. You're in lack. You don't have what you need, right? Doesn't that sound familiar, what he tells us, that he's not a good, good father? So it's the same lie that he started with in Genesis and the same lie that he's continuing now, right? But we're going to expose him today, right? We're exposing the enemy today, and Father God, we break every stronghold, Lord God. We call to surface, God, anything that would offend you in Jesus' name. Amen. I like to do prayer breaks, my bad, y'all. <laughs> Amen. So let's look at the story of Eve, right? So desirable for gaining knowledge. Is knowledge inherently evil? No. But putting it before God is. Call Pharisees, right? Eve put her own human understanding before God's perfect plan. We have to listen to this because he's telling us something so key about revival right now. He, she put her understanding, her tradition, what she thought above his perfect plan, and it cost her greatly. Who is to say he didn't have a plan for her to grow in knowledge? When Christ was here on earth, he grew in wisdom and stature. And the Bible also speaks about us going from glory to glory. So since God is the same today, tomorrow, and forever, and his word stands in Genesis and now, I like to submit that Eve was positioned to go from glory to glory, but was deceived by her own desire she put before God, her own timetable. My Lord, Lord, help us get this. Jesus, amen. We can't take the bait of what appears to be good. So one Thursday, pastor said something so um, profound that just really stuck to me. And he was talking about discernment. And in this season, I feel like the Holy Spirit really wants us to grow in discernment. He wants us to mature. I really believe that he's calling life missions. And anybody that is here, he's calling us to maturity. Because there's a world out there and there's people out there that need to hear the gospel. And guess what? If I'm not a disciple, how can I go and make other disciples? How? I have to give them what I have. So he's encountering us today. So pastor says something so beautiful. He said discernment. It's not just knowing right from wrong, right? You know, we're believers. We can understand right from wrong. Discernment, it, it, it really kicks in when, when you see right with almost right, right? When the enemy comes, he always tries to mix a little bit uh, uh, of truth with a lie. When he came to Jesus, oh, you won't surely die. The word says that the angels have charge over you. 
right? He tries to twist the truth, but guess what? Jesus had discernment. He was rooted in the word. Amen. And with Eve, he did the same thing. I feel like the Lord is saying we have to ask more from heaven. We need to ask him for discernment, especially in these times. We cannot settle in this season. We have to demand more from, he from heaven. Healing for Doris, healing for our home, healing for our family, salvation and restoration. I hear the Lord say, don't settle. Amen. So, um, hallelujah. Thanks, A. So, when I was writing this message, I feel like the Lord wanted me to weave in parts so we would be activated or we would legislate in the spirit, right? So, so we're going to legislate in about a minute, but I want to give a, a little bit of background. Um, so we legislate in the spirit. We speak um, uh, things, uh, we speak kingdom down, right? When God built this earth, he spoke it into existence, right? Man, we make contracts and we write things down and that's binding. But the kingdom of heaven is spoken out, right? When Christ was here, he sometimes, yes, touched their hands, but many times he says, you know, you're healed and you're free. Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He spoke that thing. So he wants us to use the same spirit. The Bible says that the same spirit that rules Christ from the dead is the spirit that dwells within me. So why can't I speak a thing into existence, right? We have the power and the authority in Jesus Christ to legislate. Amen? Jesus. So we're going to proclaim and, and legislate right now. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Yes, God. We're just going to pray that his kingdom come. Lord, your kingdom come, Lord God. Take out any idols in our heart, Lord God. We legislate, Lord God, that this, Lord God, this will be a marking. Just like you mark Noah, you are marking our heart, Lord God. Allow us to surrender that thing so you can deliver us from all evil and trouble. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. So this is, uh, can we go to um, Acts chapter 10, verse 4? I just want to show us a quick thing. It's like a, a little commercial break. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm God's, like, inquisitive child, so I always ask a million questions. And sometimes I ask the questions about the most simplest things, like, Lord, why do we fast? What's going on with that? What is the purpose of prayer? What really happens when I pray, right? And he led me um, to this, and I just want this verse to really drive the point home that our prayers are effective and the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Amen? Amen. Is that, okay, so Acts chapter 10, is that first four, Jose? Or can you start, start at one? Yeah, we'll go to one through four. Amen. Hallelujah. Are y'all with me? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, I'll let him pull that up. Amen. Hallelujah. We're, we're going to focus on verse 4, so that's why he had that. Amen. So um, Cornelius was an Italian, a man of God, and the Bible says, you can go back and read this, it's a great uh, story. The Bible says that he gave constantly, he gave alms, he always lifted up prayers to the Lord, right? And the Lord heard him. Look at this. So it said, Cornelius stared at him in fear. So he's staring at the angel, an angel came to him. What is it, Lord, he said. The angel answered and said, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. What do you mean, a memorial offering? Like the Washington Memorial, like the, it comes before the feet of God. So when I open my mouth in prayer, it doesn't just go into space. It comes before him. Amen. Hallelujah. So when we proclaim a, thing, a pro proclaim a thing, it is effective. Hallelujah. So let's get back to the story. Eve looked with her natural eye. She saw when it comes to revival, we have to look with our spiritual eyes. We cannot be carnal in this season. I really feel the Lord say that we need to be watchmen on the wall. She gave. Some people will eat of the wrong tree and try to feed it to you. Ideologies that don't align with the word, abortion, that's not of God. These can even be people that we love. Eve loved Adam. She loved Adam. 
But guess what? She had, she put something before God. She made that an idol, and now that thing was controlling her. And she caused somebody that she loved to fall. This is where discernment comes in, right? Amen. Eve wasn't inherently evil. She was deceived. And because she wasn't looking with her spiritual eyes, she caused her and her husband to sin, which I said. Young people, watch who you listen to. This is my teens, my young adults, my, my branded folks. Watch who you take advice from. If they're not being led by the Spirit of God, they will be deceived and cause you to believe a lie. If it happened to Adam and they were in a perfect thing, why can't it happen to us? Right? We need to be careful about who we listen to. And you know, in this day and age, everybody has an opinion. And they can find everything on backing on Wikipedia and this and that. No, the word of God is our standard. Hallelujah. We need our spiritual eyes open. Lord, continue to bring discernment. Don't think that you can defeat the enemy, me and you can defeat the enemy, without the Holy Spirit. He will run circles around us if we are not filled with the presence of God. We have an advantage to be filled with the presence of God. The word says that we are seated in heavenly places, right? Because right now, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. So we have an advantage. The enemy doesn't know what's in the mind of or in the heart of God, but we do. And that is why the Lord is, he's opening us or he's inviting us to really be filled with the presence. Because I just feel that the deception will get louder. And if you are not filled, if you and I are not filled, we will get taken away, right? And he doesn't want anything to sift us. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Yes, God. Glory. Hallelujah. So we're going to legislate again. And we're going to pray against any bad fruit that may have been presented to us from tradition, from our family, from our friends. We're going to uproot that thing and surrender it all and say, God, teach me like a little child. Hallelujah. So, Lord, yeah, just lift your hands. Lord, reveal any bad fruit that has been passed down to us by people we love, God. Lord, reveal any bad fruit that has been given to me and, and my brothers and sisters that is rooted in pride and human understanding. God, tear down the strongholds of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Holy Spirit, thank you. She put knowledge, she put the pride of life before the word of God and was able to be controlled by her desires. But we can't be mad at Eve, you know? People are like, if Eve never did that, it's because of her. We can't be mad at her, right? Because let me, let me paint the story for you, you know? I'm, I'm kind of a writer, so I like to paint stories, right? She put what she wanted above what God said. He said, hey, these are, this is how you should live. This is what you should do. This is, you know, how you should, you know, uh, 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 honor me, communicate with your, your husband, X, Y, and Z. So she put what she wanted before the word of God. Hmm. How many times have I put what I wanted? Have you and I put what we wanted before what God says? You know, where's, can I hold a Bible? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Many times we like to, to, to harp on Eve or, or say, why would she do that? But she did what we do every day. This is our standard. This is the word of God. And although they didn't have it written, they were literally walking and breathing with him. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. E, we're not mad at you. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I believe there are many things that we need to unlearn when it comes to the church and revival. Amen, right? right? Revival is not an event that you just mark on your calendar. It's not just a service, right? Church is not just confined to a building or, or, or just attending, you know, church every week. Revival is what sustains the church. In the books of Acts, members were added to the church daily. Why? Because they preached the pure gospel, 
If you love me, keep my commandments. If you want to follow me, sell everything you have. Are we seeing a theme? This is the same thing that that Christ was saying in Luke. And I love the Bible because you see that he's repeating the same thing over and over in a different way, you know, because he wants to drive a point home. So um, when I was studying this, I actually uh, wanted to read like a small excerpt from Kim Owen's book, The Doorkeepers of Revival. Amen. She's a revivalist. Anybody read this? Yeah, she's a revivalist out in Arizona. So I'm going to read a little bit about what she said about church and revival. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you have the book, it's, it's on, you know, you can read it later, but it's page 33. And this is called Big Church or Big Revival. In the modern church era, we have created a man-focused, entertainment-based, humanistic pop culture church that is far from presence-driven. There may be good music with very talented musicians and even a nice palatable, encouraging word or talk given by a charismatic communicator. However, the substance and tangibility of his realm, presence, and glory are missing. The modern church has evolved into how big can we become in name, in number, in notoriety, rather than how big our hearts are in sacrifice, in zeal, in passion for God. While I am not opposed to big churches, she says, and believe that God wants to build and bless big churches, he also wants a big move of his Holy Spirit in those big churches. We must never forget that before 3,000 was added to the Acts Church, they had a full-on Holy Ghost encounter in the upper room. Hallelujah. Thanks so much, Mel. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so when I read that, I'm like, wow, did she, like, get my sermon notes? Like, that was spot on. Thanks, Holy Spirit. And, and I like what she says, that Christ is, he's not, a, he's not against big crowds, right? But he is after our hearts, you know? And I just, I just can feel the Lord pleading. He's like, you're not fooling anybody. I see you, and I want to be intimate with you. That's all he wants, is to bless us, is to love us. What an honor it is that the creator of the universe is a loving being. Can you imagine if Satan ruled this world? Yikes. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, Jesus. I feel like he's working. Yes, Lord. Yes, God, you're working. You're working. Oh, yes, Lord, you're working right now. You're working. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way, Lord. Jesus. My Lord, the word says that the truth shall set people free. So why are we trying to make the message of Christ more digestible? It's the word that is sharper than any two double-edged sword. It's going to hurt. But guess what? Iron sharpens iron, and heat reveals who slash what people are. This is why Jesus addressed the crowd. This is why he wasn't scared, because he wanted to bring the heat. He was testing their hearts, right? Because he knew that the path of ahead would be a difficult one. And if I'm just falling because I'm a fan, because I like what you do, and because of miracles, how can I substan- like stand in, in trials? And when I can't see you, and when my, when my situation is telling me otherwise, how can I stay rooted? So he did the crowd a favor. He said, this is not an easy path to follow. And he's telling us that today, that revival is not an easy path to follow. But guess what? What is worth it? This is life and life more abundantly. Amen. Jesus. The heat reveals if they are just fans or if we're just fans or if we're going to be true disciples. It's telling us to count the costs. What do we love more than God? We need to put down our image for God's. We need to put down our tradition, our comfort. This is just how I am. I I remember when I went to this one um, uh, uh, preaching. 
or this one sermon, I was in Newark, and the preacher said something so profound, and it, and it stayed with me. He was talking about how Jesus, you know, you know how we have those personality tests? And it's like, I'm, I'm this person, and I'm, I'm shy, I don't really speak, and, you know, I'm extrovert, all, all those IBG, I, I don't know all the, you know, the terms. But he said something so, so funny. He was like, Jesus wasn't asking, like, okay, you know, what's your personality? Are you shy? Oh, oh, you're shy? Okay, you don't have to, you know, make disciples, Amanda's fine, you just chill, you know. Or, oh, you're an extrovert, okay, now I'm going to put you, and you're going to do this. No, he didn't act. We are all called to make disciples, no matter how discomfort we may feel, no matter how awkward we may feel, it's for God to get the glory. Why are we so worried about our image? We're made to bear his image, amen? And I'm talking to myself. He's like, why are you nervous? It's not about you. You're just the facilitator. It's him. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. These things, this is my personality or this is my tradition or this is what I'm used to, to cannot come before God and what he desires. They can't. They can't. I feel like 2020 was a drawing in the sand and he's continuing it. He has to have true disciples in this season. We have to put these things down and pick up God's wants. And if we're having a hard time, we need to admit that to him, right? Because if we don't admit it to him, how can he come in? The Bible says that he stands at the door and knock. He doesn't barge in. So if I'm not honest, how can he come in and eat with me? Hallelujah. Jesus. So he wants us to take up his desires, I mean desires to bear his image. It's called an exchange for a reason. So let's talk about exchange and presence. And we're just going to touch on this briefly because I have slides and I want to show the slides, but I just want to I want to touch on exchange and presence really really briefly. So Uh, I'm going to go to the story of Moses. We're not going to read it, but um, it's in Exodus 19 and 20 if you want to go, you know, in your own time and study. Um, So we know Moses uh, was a man of presence, and he he went into the presence of God. Ah, I love this. This is my favorite part. He went into the presence of God and came out with strategy and instruction, the Ten Commandments, which in essence said, die to self and put God first, not my will, but your will. Does this sound a little bit familiar? Let's look at the life of Christ. We know and understand that God in Christ was, well, Christ was a man of, of prayer and a man of presence, and he often went away many times to pray. Christ went into presence and fulfilled the law of Moses. He became a sacrifice. He personified what the law asks us to do, to die to ourselves. He crucified his flesh for God to get the glory. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And these are the same words we need to have in revival. Let's say it together. Not, Lord, not my will but your will be done. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Amen. Jesus. Not our wants and desires, not our ideas, not for my name or fame, but his will, his thoughts, and his ways. Presence should change us. We come here week by week. Presence, the presence of God is here meeting with us. Presence should change us, but not just here when we're in our secret place the other six days out the week. The word says that we go from glory to glory. It is God's desire for us to grow in wisdom and stature just like Jesus. If we are not being transformed are called to die, sacrifice things on the, on the altar, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Some crowds like the idea of a man that can do miracles, but they don't desire for God's will to be fulfilled in their life. This is a life abundantly, to have a life laid down for God. This is why we were created. You know, many times we try to find... Um, 
value in the world and we think this will fill us and that will fill us, but we're not created for that. So you will always end up empty, just like the Samaritan woman. It doesn't matter where you go. You, we are, our purpose is, is spoken by the creator. We can't tell the creator why we were made. You know, whether we like it or not, God made us and we are designed to bear his image. So anything outside of that will not leave us with peace, will leave us unsatisfied, will leave us longing. Oh, are you, are you all with me? Amen. Hallelujah, God. We thank you. Jesus. The crowd says, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you. Just don't ask me to do anything in return. There are people who just want the hand of God, but not his heart. Let's not be people who have and hoard knowledge, but don't have experience with God. Let's not be people who hoard truth with no action, with no life transformation. God is tired of crowds and people who just want to know things but not be intimate. Lack of intimacy is an enemy of revival. My God. Amen. Help us, Lord. Hear what the Lord is saying. Don't settle and don't just be book smart. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There's something special about activating yourself. There's something to me hearing and then me applying my knowledge. So um, I work for the Department of Health uh, and, and my job is I manage apprenticeship programs. I, I manage apprenticeship programs and grants. And what we're finding is that the apprenticeship model is so effective. It's something so, um, I can't put into words, but it's so effective to the point, it's like people learn, but then they immediately are simultaneously go and apply that thing. And it's even being like more risen to the, the surface uh, above like a four year college, right? Because people can, graduate or get done with their program and know exactly what to do. And, and if the world is, is seeing that, hey, it's something special about this person learning, but then them actually applying, them actually sitting under somebody and being discipled, if they understood this, what is God saying? He's saying that we have to apply the word. When Christ was here, he applied everything he said. His word is alive and active. And there's something in you, there's something in me that is going to break when I begin to speak my testimony, when I begin to, to pray or prophesy over somebody, when I begin to use the gifts that God's given me. It's applied knowledge. It gets rooted in my mind, right? Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen. Allow Christ to make himself alive and active in your life, in our lives. He doesn't just want to sit on the shelf in your house and be pulled out in dire situations. How would you feel if your, your friend only called you like in dire situations and never called you to check up on you? That wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? I would block them. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm saved by the Lord. Grace. Amen. He's not interested in being a one-night stand or only a once-in-a-while thing. This is a life commitment, a decision to live transformed. I think I feel like I need to repeat that. This is a life commitment, a decision to live transformed. And I think I have to say this. I have to, 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 to be honest that, you know, it, it's for life. You know, serving God is for life, and it's not always going to be easy, but it's worth it. And maybe another time, you know, I'll share my testimony, but, but this is what we are created to do. There is fullness, and there is peace. My God, there is unsearchable peace in the presence of God. Whatever you're searching for, I promise, I'm a living witness that he can meet your every need. Hallelujah. Jesus. Oh, he's so good. Amen. Ooh, so let's talk a little bit about enemies and helpers of revival. 
And this is what we're going to, to end with. Uh, we have a couple slides on this. Amen. Hallelujah. Enemies and helpers of revival. Amen. Enemies of revival. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The word says in 1 John 2, 16, the amplified version, for all that is in the world, not just some things, the Bible says all, and remember this is our standard, for all that is in the world, the lust and the sensual cravings of the flesh and the lust and the longing of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. Jesus. All we need is scripture sometimes, you know? I don't even need to say anything else to that. Amen. Next slide. Thanks, Jose. Hallelujah. So let's contrast. This is like teaching moment. Tradition and revival. And I believe that the Lord, he, he wants us, and we are going to be, in Jesus' name, successful. And he's, he's establishing something that, that, it, that is going to last until he comes back, right? So he has to prepare us. Amen? He's preparing us. Hallelujah. So tradition, Pharisees, is the transmissions of customs or beliefs from generation to generation. My grandma did this. My mom did this. You know, this is how it's always been done in my family. Or the fact of being passed on in that way. Many theologians describe this as a doctrine believed to have divine authority, though not in the scriptures. Wow. You know, that's straight from, from Webster Online. And that's, wow. I, when I wrote that, I was like, wow. What is revival in Christ? So I did a, some research, and I kind of put together um, a definition from many definition, definitions that I found. So revival for the Christian is a restoration and re reawakening of God's divine order. He wants us to get back to the garden, back to Genesis, back to us walking with him. Amen? The action of returning something to a former owner, place, or condition the reinstatement of a previous practice, right, custom, or situation. Amen. What is tradition? What, it, what, what are some things that tradition says? Righteousness through works. It's by what I do. If I pray for 100 people, you know, you know this is how we usher in revival. You know, if I invite the, the, the best speakers and, you know, I say all the right things and, you know, this is how we usher in revival. And it says I'm righteous, uh, you know, through, through the law and I have to keep everything. But revival says blood brought righteousness through Christ. Amen. Tradition is man led. Three songs uh, for, for 20 minutes, uh, then we're going to cut and we're going to go to the, the announcements, but not too long. Then we're going to let people go because, you know, everybody's going to be upset. <laughs> no, I just, I can just, no, right? What does revival say? It says spirit led. Lord, whatever you want to do, because where do I have, what's more important to me than, than abiding with you right now? Where, where do I really have to go that's more important than meeting with the, my creator, than the one that spoke the world into existence? He's more important than our to-do list. It can wait. <laughs> Amen. What does tradition say? It's apathy towards the thing of God. Oh, they're having another, you know, Bible study. I'm tired. I already went on Thursday. <laughs> it's apathy. You know, sometimes annoyance, it, 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 you, the enemy tries to hide in annoyance, but it's really apathy towards the, the thing of God. And if I'm feeling disinterested in what I'm designed and created to do, I need to start praying. 
That should be a sign like, God, what's going on? I'm created to abide with you. You literally created me to walk with you. So why? Why do I have apathy towards the things that I'm created to do? Amen? What does, re- what does revival say? It says zeal for the house of the Lord. Amen. Pastor, can we open the, the house on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Like zeal for the house, right? It's serving. Amen? God doesn't want us to be on milk our, our, our whole life. It, it's saying, okay, God, what else can I do? Lord, what, what do you have for me in the season? It's being excited. You know, I, I, I'm not into, like, basketball or, like, football. I mean, I like basketball, but I don't have a team. But, you know, like, you have your team, your sports player, maybe soccer. You know, my, my people in the back, I know, like soccer. You know, you're, you're, you're rowdy about that thing. Like, yes, oh, it's coming on. Even before the game starts, you have everything situated. You got your food down. You're like, yeah, nobody talk to me. Phone on, do not disturb. You know what I'm saying? And if you're not a sports fan, whatever you're interested in, right? We should have more zeal for the things of God. Amen. And I'm not saying it's bad to be excited about the the team. But if you see that you're more excited about your your team playing and you have apathy toward the thing of God, then, then Houston, again, we have a problem. Amen. Help us, Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Tradition is rooted in vanity and pride by what I know. You know, I went to, you know, seminary, and I, I'm trained in this, and I'm that, and, you know, I, 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 you know, you're right. I don't know who's checklist, but that's funny, right? By vanity and pride. What, is, what, did, what did Jesus exemplify when he is here? Humility. If anybody should have been prideful, it's him. The creator of the universe put himself in our clay bodies. I still can't understand that. Somebody described it to me like this. Imagine, you know, you have a sheet of paper and you're drawing stick figures, right? You're drawing like a little stick town. And then imagine you becoming one of those stick figures. What? And I have to run off and do my to-do list? Like, I, I don't get it. Me. Tradition says it's not by my strength. No, tradition says it's by my strength. Excuse me. Revival says it's by his spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And this is, this is our last slide, um, amen, of, of strategy. Because I feel like every time God comes with teaching and correcting, he always gives strategy because he loves us so much. So these are helpers of revival, spirit-led. Anything that draws us near into the presence of God is getting back to the basics. It's modeling the life and what Christ did. It's prayer. It's fasting. It's word. It's worship. And it's sharing the unadulterated gospel, sharing your testimony. Just saying, hey, this is what God did for me. Many times I feel like we get so intimidated about sharing the gospel, but sharing the gospel is our story. The Bible says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Your coworker asks you, you know, how's your day going? You don't have to throw John 3.16 in their face. You can say, you know what? My day started like this, but God, he turned it around for me. You know, and now I feel supernatural peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to end with this. Amen. Just this one question. Every eye closed. Just this one question, Jesus. My Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord. Will I, will you, will we be a helper or an enemy of revival?